Good evening and apologies for our delay. We're trying to move from one meeting to the next and here we are. So this is the study session for June 24th, 2024. Um, and uh, Mr. City Manager, I have the <coughs> State of the Legislative Update. Do you have any comments to get us ready to go on this and where we go? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Mayor and members of the council. This evening, uh, we have a representative from the city's lobbying firm, John Barget and Associates. Uh, we are uh, really pleased and privileged to be joined by Chris Ropey, uh, who works with that firm. Uh, he is here to give us an update uh, on this past legislative session and uh, how the city fared in general. So at this point, I'd be happy to turn it over to Mr. Ropey. Thank you, Zach. Um, good evening, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. Uh, Mr. Mayor, it's always great to see you, and it's always great to be in the hometown of President uh, Truman. Uh, my name is Chris Ropey. I am a, one of the lobbyists with John Barjain Associates, who has the privilege and honor to represent the City of Independence um, down in Jefferson City um, inside the Capitol. Um, it's good to see some familiar faces that I've got to visit with and got to know and, and see some new ones and um, look forward to working with everybody. Um, Zach and, and John in particular, we have a, a, a really good line of communication and, and, and I feel like I want to thank them publicly for all they do to, to make sure we know what issues are of importance and, and what we need to be working on and, and they get us very quick answers um, so that way we can be focusing on the issues um, that are of importance and, and as many of you know with government things move rapidly at a lot of times and also very slowly at times but it, it is it's nice to have a client who does such a good job of communicating and that really is the key to a successful relationship which means success for the city um, of independence uh, we do bi-weekly calls uh, we go over all the bills that are filed um, and, and try to find ones that look like will be of importance because they're either bad or they're good and figure out what that looks like and, and take direction from there on what issues we, we work on and want to go engage on uh, on behalf of the city. Um, and they're always a, a phone call and a text message away and like I said, just very good at getting information and answers to us on, on things we're working on. Um, no legislative session is identical and, and anytime you say you think you've seen it all, something comes up and happens that you that you definitely have not seen before um, this session in particular was, was the most bizarre that I've ever been a part of um, um, and that the mayor had had the privilege to serve in Jefferson City or maybe not the privilege I don't know depending on how it how you look at things from time to time um, but it was definitely one that was very uh, very unique and there's a lot of reasons that went into that um, it seemed like um, they went months without getting anything done and just bickering and infighting and everybody seemed to be running for a statewide office um, or you know re representatives running for senate and it just led to a, not a lot of cooperation um, as you are aware republicans um, strongly controlled the majorities in both the house and the senate and they didn't get along on anything with the that you've seen in the press i'm sure with all of the different factions um, that exist and and the the Democrats, for the most part, just kind of sat back and watched the infighting happen with Republicans and um, did the hard work in the Democrats' minds of stopping and slowing down and killing all the bad bills that existed. And they really just didn't get um, a whole lot done. Um, if you look overall at things, um, they, t they passed 46 total bills, of which 18 of them are uh, were appropriation bills, which those are constitutionally mandated. That's the one thing they have to do um, in Jeff City um, during the legislative session. And there were 20, my math's right, 28 what I would call regular policy bills that made it across the finish line. Um, you, you look at the next steps in that process, and I'll talk about some of those bills that I know are of interest of ones that didn't pass and ones that, ones that did pass, um, specifically on the budget. June 30th is the deadline for when the governor will announce his decisions. Um, the legis he proposes the budget, then the legislature makes changes to it, um, then sends those final changes to the, to the, to the governor for his, his decision making on items that he wants to keep or, or remove, and that is due at the end of the fiscal year, which is the end of this month, and there will be um, a lot of broken hearts when he comes out with his announcements on, um, on projects or other items in the budget that he he will choose not to fund um, the rumor going around jeff city in political circles is that 
if an item wasn't in his recommendations back in January when he released his state budget, uh, that there's a good chance that he's going to line item veto that specific project or item. And the legislature did add um, a lot of different projects. Um, and one of those I'll talk about here in a second as well that I know is important to, to many of you uh, with the drop-in shelter. Um, if you, you look at the policy pieces of legislation, he has until July 14th to make decisions on those. And that's different than the budget bills where he can't pick and choose different provisions or sections within those bills. It's a take it or leave it. It's either the whole bill or, or none of it. Um, and at, I'd say if you look at the topics of bills that were filed, education and healthcare bills usually are the most popular. Um, and then I'd, I'd say probably if you look by volume, the third most popular topic is legislation that gets in, in the middle of political subdivisions and trying to, the state trying to tell you what to do. Um, so a lot of, and some, some of them are helpful, um, but I'd say 95% and you would probably all consider not helpful and say, leave us alone, let us do what's best for, um, for our city and, and make those decisions. Um, getting into uh, specifically some of the issues that, that we worked on, um, going back to the drop-in shelter and, and that going here and getting some of that money to help with that. Um, we were very blessed to get half a million dollars put in the budget in the House um, as that House Bill 2011, which is the Department of Health and Social Services budget, um, made it out of the House, um, which is a good thing as it, it has appeared to be more, more fiscally conservative than, than the Senate. And so we knew we were in a good position where that probably was going to be the, the low point got the Senate to add another half a million dollars to it. So we were up to a million dollars in funding to help with that project. And then in the back and forth in the very strange legislative session that occurred, um, the, the final number as they went with a lower number overall in the budget, it was reduced to the house amount of half a million dollars, which I know will still have a tremendous impact in, in getting that project going and taking the next steps in that project. We will know here in the next 14 days or whatever it is, what the governor will decide to, to do with that, and we will keep everybody posted um, once once we know what his final decision is on that, as well as the 53 billion other dollars that are in the budget um, that he is trying to deal with. Um, another issue of importance, and specifically if you look at it from law enforcement perspective and community safety perspective, is Blair's Law finally got done, which I know um, for a lot of our larger cities in the state um, and the 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 connection to how that started um, of, of uh, firearm and, and, and firing that in um, municipality and increasing some, some crimes for that um, finally made it across the finish line as a part of a larger criminal justice bill. Um, and like I said, we will know on uh, July 14th if the governor will sign or veto that bill. I think it's, there's a good, unless they find something technically wrong with it, um, a lot of those provisions passed in previous sessions um, and they fixed the issue that caused the veto in the past, and, and I do feel good about him signing that piece of legislation. Um, they also passed an increase in historical um, tax credits to incentivize that outside of what we would, you know, tr traditionally consider your urban core to try to promote that in more suburban and more, more rural areas of our state, taking that from a 25% um, match to a 35% match in what you can be reimbursed for and, and trying to get the ball rolling on, on some of those um, historic um, programs and some of those historic buildings um, away from the, the urban areas where that has been the main focus um, since the program has been as a, in existence. Um, there was House Bill 2062 this year that passed that had several components to it that dealt with um, what I would call local government um, type issues. Um, there, you've, and this is mostly focused on what you have read and seen in Kansas City with a moratorium on, on being able to evict people um, where that was prohibited. Uh, there, there was a big pu push by Republicans to get that passed this session where a city couldn't keep a landlord from doing that. So just to make everybody aware that that, that bill did pass that has those changes in there which would limit you. And if you, if you had a policy or ever wanted to do something on that, that's what the state law will now, now be on that if that's signed in, into legislation. Um, another piece of that legislation that I know is of interest to a lot of our larger municipalities around the state um, is a prohibition 
on requiring EV stations in certain private businesses or, or other entities or organizations that would be within your, your city. There was a big push for a, a total, total prohibition that, that would limit you and hinder your ability. And through legislative negotiations, um, compromises and, and people trying to take, you know, what I, what I consider and say, you know, half a bite of the apple and not get greedy and try to take the whole thing. The legislation got watered down where you could only, you could only limit it to um, churches and non-for-profits. So a municipality could not force a non-for-profit or a church um, to put in an EV charging station in their parking lots. Um, you still will have the right, if you would choose to ever go down that path, um, to be able to pursue that for any other entity or, or organization or landowner, commercial um, property or, or business, if that's what you wanted to do for, for your city. Um, there's a lot of, like I said, bad legislation filed and pushed very hard this session. Uh, the big thing that you see from Republicans is to, to cut taxes um, and, and cut taxes. And that's, that's obviously a political um, issue that wants to get talked about. But a lot of times people forget and don't want to talk about what does that mean for services if you don't have the revenue um, to, to provide for your communities. Um, there has been a push the last several years to cut the sales tax on, on groceries and food. Um, and it, it's millions and millions and millions of dollars um, for municipalities around the state. Um, and we fortunately were able to work with a lot of other municipalities um, that had, had lobbyists helping their interest in the capital um, to stop that from advancing forward and, and passing this past session and what that would have meant in the services, whether it's firefighters or police officers that you would have had to taken off the streets and be, be available um, with the amount of, of cuts that would have had, had to have been made for that. Um, another bill I want to bring to your all's attention that was in our, our report at the end of the session um, for any political subdivision, just to be aware of this, um, House Bill 2111 gives some new powers to the state auditor as far as the process and how he can go in and audit political subdivisions. Where before, um, I'm, I'm just not that familiar with it, but there are steps where you, know, you could have a citizen petition, um, folks within government could request that audit. This would essentially allow the auditor to unilaterally go do that in certain circumstances without that um, concerns being brought to him or his office where he would be able to go do some things now that he, um, if this is signed into law, that he, he currently can't do. Um, there's an effort to always change our community improvement district process in those elections or your TDDs and how those elections work. And um, there was a big push by Republicans this session to change that where you had to pass those um, to form one or to make changes to, to those on a, a citywide vote and not just the area that's affected by it. And I think that would create a lot of challenges. Um, a lot of municipalities um, spoke up against those. That way you all could, could keep um, your flexibility to be able to go and do the things you need to do to develop your communities and, and parts of your communities that are, are in most need of those types of tools that state law allows for. Um, I saw the chief over here um, earlier and said hi. Uh, failure to appear and what that means for law enforcement. I know it's always been a big deal in this region and in this area. Um, and the chief came down and did a great job testifying. Um, there was a lot of folks from St. Louis from law enforcement who came and testified at the committee hearing. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of resistance to giving law enforcement those tools um, that they have had previously um, to be able to go and, and hold people accountable so that way that you can keep things uh, more safe in your communities, and, and that's something that um, I hope you all will pursue next year um, as, as you develop your legislative agenda, but that, that was something that I know was important and had a great hearing and, and steps in the process. Just there's a lot of resistance from folks um, from some of the stuff that happened in St. Louis in the past, and, um, and it, it's one of those unintended consequences that has affected the rest of the state. Um, there was some other legislation that dealt with limiting drone usage for law enforcement, which was a, a big deal. Um, if you look and read between the lines of, of what brought this around that wants to limit um, local law enforcement's ability to use drones to, to protect the public, um, and it has to do with competition from the drone manufacturers and the technology where they wanted to block out somebody and say you could only use these certain ones. Um, and I think a lot of infrastructure in those areas have been um, paid for by law enforcement um, and by, by 
by police around the state where it would have been a big cost to have to go and make changes that were unnecessary and simply government trying to intervene and in, in picking and choosing what you could or couldn't use um, and, and law enforcement as a whole was very against the legislation that we we're happy to be able to go help um, fight against and get that blocked. Um, the c catalytic converter issue, which if you, those thefts are happening everywhere, I know that's important, um, again, from a public safety perspective. Um, the, what I would call, if this really exists, the scrap special interest in there, not wanting to have to have a database and keep track of those so they can get crime down with what happens as, as people are stealing those from vehicles and what that does for um, areas of town and, and communities around the state. Um, that will be a big issue again next year, and, and it always gets held up by one or two senators who um, have some, some pretty big heavy hitters in the scrap industry in their districts that they um, are, are opposing and, and fighting that legislation. I know utility issues are always, always a big deal, as, as you have um, your own utility here. Um, one of the issues that we tried to, to fight and stop this year and just were unsuccessful um, was on the streaming services and not being able to tax those. Um, talk to, obviously, the lo our local delegation as well as other legislators um, about that legislation, and a lot of them just truly felt that if they voted against that bill, it was them raising taxes on their constituents and saying we're going to now allow taxing of um, those streaming services, and we, we unfortunately were not able to convince um, enough people to be against that to, to stop that from happening. Um, we, we did successfully stop a utility relocation um, policy that was being pushed that would have handcuffed you and would have, would have forced your utilities to do things and not be re re recompensated for those, um, those costs that went into that and, and are fortunate to be able to, to stop that and, and save those costs. Um, and I will, I'll answer any questions on other bills that I didn't just mention there, or if anyone has questions beyond that, and a few other things to wrap up with. Um, as you all know, it's a big election year, um, very big election year. Um, due to a lot of things, including redistricting that has occurred and what these legislative districts look like, there aren't a lot of competitive um, general elections that exist uh, and, and for legislative, state legislative seats anymore. So a lot of these races around the state and the direction that the legislature is going to go um, will be decided here in the next six weeks um, with the August primary. There are a handful of competitive um, general election um, races, which one of them will be right here to see who replaces Senator Razor, which I know you all, or excuse me, Senator Rizzo, um, who you all will are very familiar with. Uh, we will miss Senator Rizzo very much. He was a great advocate for the city of independence and was great to work with um, all these years to help protect and fight for um, for your your interests and he did a great job of, of stopping a lot of bad stuff and helping stop a lot of bad stuff that was out there um, being pushed um, the most attention gets paid paid to probably this governor's primary um, the latest polling I've seen and heard is it's neck and neck between Lieutenant Governor Kehoe and Secretary of State Ashcroft, six weeks to go, that's an eternity, a lot of things could, could happen and we'll see how that all shakes out and um, everybody has an opinion about which one of those two gentlemen they like better and, and how that would, would work for um, and look like for the policies that come out of their offices and I'll, I'll let you decide what, what you prefer but that is, is out there and will be um, talked about a lot um, over the next, the next six weeks. Um, we're, we're lucky for this area to have the majority floor leader soon to be speaker um, who I know is a really good friend of your mayor's here, and John Patterson, who is butts right up against the city of Independence with his district um, and has been a tremendous help for um, interest to you all as well. Um, and it'll be nice to have him as, as the speaker going into the next two legislative sessions to be able to rely on him and, and talk to him about issues of importance and, and figuring out um, what we can do to help him and what he can do to help um, do things that are good for the state in that role and, and for this area in this region. I know it's always top of mind um, for him. We have a new floor leader in the house that will take his spot. It's a young man by the name of Alex Riley, who is an attorney from Springfield, who will be the next floor leader um, for two years, will serve in that role. And in the Senate, um, Senator Rizzo was the minority leader. There'll be a new minority leader with, with him um, being termed out of office, and there will be a new president pro tem 
um, that is likely to be Senator Cindy O'Laughlin, who is the current floor leader in the, in the Senate, and she will assume the role of, of President Pro Tem if she is elected to that by her colleagues, which everyone expects her to be. Um, there will be a, a race for the floor leader's position um, going into the next um, two-year two -year cycle for that. And that's important because they dictate what bills come up and don't come up and which ones get a lot of time and don't get much time. Um, which sets the policy for the whole state. And so that's why those roles, those legislative leadership roles um, are very important. Um, the last policy issue I'll, I'll talk about is um, the, your ability to put your tourism tax on the ballot to make some changes that you wanna make for your community center to help fund some of those um, operating costs. Um, I know we got brought in in I think late January, early February. So we missed the ability to have that legislation pre-filed December 1st. Um, got it real close on several bills um, to the finish line and there were several other cities trying to do something similar for their communities. None of them made it across the finish line because of the dysfunction. But um, if you do make that a priority again next year, I know we have two years to get it done before I think the timing of, of when you will need it. I feel good about our chances if we can get it pre-filed and work with folks to, to move it along um, as, as quick as possible and get that, get that done for you so you can have that tool at least to send to your voters if you choose to. Um, I am gonna stop talking now and happy to answer any questions or get into any other details um, of any other bills that I did or didn't mention. Anyone, any other questions? Please proceed. Chris, thank you. You've been a great host when we come to Jefferson City and a great advocate for independence. And we know you clearly love our president and um, it's been a joy to work with you. So thank you. Thank you for your kind words. We, we really are privileged and honored to represent the city. Anyone else? Go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Chris, for, for all the work you're doing down there. It's not always the stuff that we need to get pushed across the finish line. It's the stuff that we need to, need to stop before it gets to the finish line. And, and one of those is the CID. We're getting ready to put a bow on one on the 24 highway. In fact, the votes need to be in by tomorrow. And those are the tools that have been very success, successful helping independence and specifically Western independence to help develop itself and kind of get things moving over there. So when they get in and Jeff City doesn't realize the impact that those changes can make drastically for certain parts of our, our city that needs those different tools. So thank you for keep working on that. Yeah, you, you bet. And I, th I really do think as those, those types of, of changes will continue to be pursued by legislators who think they're being abused in places, and maybe they are in their community. I, I can't speak to, to that for sure, um, but I know it has been a really good tool here, and, and we certainly don't want the legislature to take away your ability to do what, what you need to do um, for your community. And with Representative Patterson uh, becoming speaker, who's going to be an advocate for this, this area and this region, um, love to work with him to make sure that no changes or the right changes occur so you still have that flexibility um, and, and either either any of the candidates that I know personally that are running for state senate I think would do would do the same thing and, and, and really stand up and fight for, for your interests which are going to be important to have on the senate side sure. um, as well. Thanks. Anyone else other? I'll be very brief on this. This is a thorn. I asked too many questions the last time we had a study session. <laughs> Any chances of Senate Bill 5 being modified in favor of the cities? Are you talking about the the, the old Senate Bill 5 from right. and the, and just the the now U.S. Senator Schmidt when he was a state, that, right. that issue? You know, that has been a very fascinating political issue to see where, you you know, traditionally you, you see a, a legislator who you would think is we're gonna to be tough on crime and we're gonna give law enforcement tools and they, they really don't see that issue that way anymore. And I think it's a, you know, it's a boomerang where it went way out here and I think it's coming back. Um, I know the chief in that hearing, I mean, we, it was great feedback from those committee members. I just think you have a handful of senators who um, are gonna be just resistant to it because they, they still see it as the exact issue that they talked about, where it's not a, you know, a, a public safety or a law enforcement <clears throat> issue that they're worried about, but that it's a, you know, putting people in jail who can't afford it and then they can't make it to work and, and it's being abused to help cities collect taxes and, and uh, or, you know, they call it taxes and, you know, you broke the law, sure. you broke the law. So 
it's, t- it's going gonna, it's gonna to be tough. I, I think, I don't know that you'll get all of it ever back, but I think like the failure to appear part and, and some of the things around the edges, I do think, depending how these primaries go, could, could tell what that might look like and could have a better chance if some of those go, um, go the right way. And we'll talk offline. I appreciate that. I, I, anyone else other questions? But I just appreciate uh, you every time I go to Jeff City or I make a phone call, you always get back. And I, I know you've been a really strong advocate and you've helped us out. So I can't say thank you enough. And please uh, pass on my uh, hello to uh, John. He does a great job. The two of you do a great job. So I just kind of say thank you enough. Anyone else? And, and he told me to say hello. He is actually doing the same thing I'm doing to our community college association, which we, re- we have the the joy to represent, which I know um, with uh, Metro here and having, having a few author or a few campuses here, that's important to your community as well. So, Perfect. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank Mr. you City all. Manager, anything else left on that topic? Nothing, sir. Thank you. All right. Perfect. That'll bring us up to the update for the Chamber of Commerce. Mr. City Manager, do you have anything you want to frame that? Sure. I'll do that while our, our next speaker starts to come up. So as the council may recall, back in November 2022, you approved a new contractual agreement with the Chamber of Commerce, uh, what was officially termed the Independence Economic Development Partnership to help represent the city in our economic development dealings. Uh, Tonight, we are going to hear a presentation from representatives of the Chamber of Commerce about um, the progress to date with that partnership. Uh, and to get us started, I will turn it over to Chairman of the Board, Yvonne Hall. been thoroughly impressed by the hard work um, of the of the chamber, the volunteers, the chamber staff, the passion, uh, just to promote um, independence um, and economic development in independence. Um, by the end of the year, you know, my, my second half will run fast, and I'm sure I'll be even prouder of the great works of the chamber, um, in particular Jody Kranz. You know, I wanted to let you know that Jody isn't here tonight. Um, she is suffering a pretty serious medical condition, and um, any prayers and thoughts you have, we would sure appreciate it for Jody at this time. Tonight, I'd like to just kind of give an overview of tonight's presentation. We will be um, div- or overview of the economic development activity that we've had this year. We'll give you a project up report of the partnerships of the strategic plan. We'll also overview um, of key initiative or key performance indicators and economic development related data. So just a brief history again, as Mr. Walker mentioned, we did enter into a contract with the City Council back in December of 2022 um, for the partnership for economic development. It's a two-year term with an option for extension. Um, It is operating as a public-private partnership under the Chamber's umbrella. The Economic Development Division of the Chamber is led by Ron Finke, and he serves as IEDP Chair of the Board. Advisory board is made up of 20 members and they do meet quarterly. And we did update our strategic plan, which was adopted in April of 2023. So at this point, I would like to turn the program over to Tom Lesnick, who is president and CEO of the chamber. Well, thank you, Yvonne, and uh, good evening, Mayor and members of the council. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak to you tonight and talk about our, our progress on our economic development program. Uh, As was mentioned uh, 18 months ago, we started our contract uh, with the city, contract for services. Um, We provided you and our private sector partners with a monthly update. I hope you've enjoyed that and gotten information from that. And uh, feel free to share that. We we sent it out to to elected officials and and our stakeholders 
uh, to keep them updated, but it's also to be shared with the community. Much of the information is not confidential, it's, it's general information, so um, I hope you find that valuable. Um, you've probably seen some of the drone videos we've done to kind of promote some of the development projects. Um, uh, feel free to share that social media. The last video we did, I think, had over, had over 500 views, so it's a very effective marketing tool for us. I'm going to get into some detail on some uh, various things. Um, if I don't jump back too many slides. Um, first of all, I'm going to talk about project activity, first of all. Um, I'll start with industrial. Uh, obviously, many of you know the first two North Point buildings uh, are, are um, out of the ground and are now being marketed. Uh, they're bookend buildings, or what we refer to bookend buildings, 286,000 square foot each. We've had a number of prospects who have looked at those buildings. Uh, Weed and Hammer, which will be the first tenant in one of the buildings, uh, they're just starting their build out now to occupy the building late this summer and early this fall. We've been working with the Kansas City Area Development Council and the Missouri Partnership um, to look at external leads that could come to our community. And I've been doing economic development and independence off and on for 17 years or so. And this is an exciting time for industrial development. You'll see in some of our data later on, we really didn't have industrial space to market whatsoever in this community. And it's nothing more frustrating for an economic developer than to have a prospect come to your door and say, hey, you know, we're looking for space and we just have to say, sorry, there's no room at the end. So that's, uh, that's one of our big challenges. But um, the start of the North Point project in the, uh, in the Eastgate Commerce Center is, is an incredible, um, incredible tool for us to attract jobs and capital investment to our community. Uh, on the retail side a little bit, um, we're really st continuing to see a shift in retail. Um, and it started with online websites like Amazon and, and various ones like that. Um, the pandemic kind of accelerated that process. Uh, and even today, we still see people who find the convenience of shopping from home to be um, you know, something they like to do. And it's even gotten to a point now where they can buy clothing, which we thought was kind of immune from online, but when you can buy clothing or buy shoes and uh, turn around and send it back, uh, usually at no cost, um, it's had an impact on some of our brick and mortar uh, retailers. Certainly the passage of the use tax helped us from a, uh, I think from a financial standpoint in terms of being able to uh, capture some of those, uh, the revenues for, uh, for city government services. Uh, but, you know, the retail sector is our largest independence. It employs over 15,000 people, and retail is obviously uh, very important. The shift we're seeing in retail is that most retail now is experiential. That means people want to have an experience when they go somewhere. They're not going there just to shop. They're going there to experience something. And so we're, we're seeing trends like that more and more. Retailers are getting away from having a lot of inventory in the, in the retail store. They're putting that into warehouses, which is cheaper space. Uh, and they can do drop ship, same day shipping in many cases. And so uh, that's starting to change. The retail footprint is becoming smaller as retailers become more showrooms than they do um, uh, places where you can actually take home items. Final area I'll kind of hit on a little bit is, is housing. And uh, we've certainly seen uh, you know, a good trend in housing. Uh, you know, every community in the country doesn't have enough inventory of housing, and we're not any different, but uh, we have seen a little bit of a shift in that. So we um, obviously have some multifamily projects that have come along here in the last year, and I'll talk about those in some of the, the data points. But it is one of the most important things. Obviously, um, when somebody comes into the community, they're looking at places for not only the CEO, but the people who sweep floors. And so having a wide, diverse range of housing is pretty important. Um, that single-family housing is, is still in great demand. There's a project at RDMI's that will provide some single-family housing. Uh, Newtown is, has done well, and it continues to build out next phases. And uh, I, I think really with the announcement of North Point in the Valley, we saw a, a pretty dynamic change in interest by housing developers uh, who previously wouldn't look at independence, and now they are. One of the things we are working on, and it actually came out of a study session a few weeks ago, was... Um, uh, a business license feedback survey to ask our businesses who are pulling new business licenses um, how the experience was, how were they, was, it, was, it, was the ease of use good, was you know, the process good, and we just sent out the first survey um, about 10 days ago. Uh, we'll continue to compile that data as it comes in and share that with city staff as, long, as well as council, um, but I think in everything we do, we want to make sure the process is simple and easy and convenient. Uh, for any business, especially a new business that's coming into the community. And then finally, we work very closely with the Innovation Center. Um, Jody Krantz continues to serve on the board as a, as a board member. Um, 
one of the things with the incubator that when we started in 2010, we really wanted to accomplish was to keep those businesses here in the community. We're helping them grow and get started, but in many cases, um, you know, in some cases, because of lack of space, we weren't able to retain those. And so Jody's worked very closely with many of them. I know uh, Natalie Pickens is in the audience back here. She uh, was helped by Jody to find a location up on the square. Uh, we worked very closely with Novus Power to find an existing building down in the valley, and, and they have become a permanent, uh, permanent business here in the community in their own space. Uh, three areas I'll talk about in terms of our strategic plan imp implementation. We had not done a strategic plan since 2004 with economic development, so we were long overdue. A lot of things had changed in, uh, certainly in those, uh, in those 19 years. Uh, one of the first things was website. Uh, we were essentially starting new. Uh, although we kind of took over the role of the former Economic Development Council, um, we needed a brand new website. It needed to be updated anyway, and that is the first place that businesses go. Sometimes we don't get the phone call until after they've done their research. They go to our website and they look at demographic information. They're looking at commercial real estate availability. They're looking at incentives. They're doing their homework before they ever pick up the phone and talk to us. And so partnership.biz is the website. It's a subsection of the uh, Chamber website, um, has a lot of activity. A lot of good information if you haven't checked it out. Uh, workforce development is another big area that uh, we were a little bit short on. Uh, most people don't realize we have about 20 organizations in our community that, that are involved with workforce development in some way, shape, or form. But what they have never done is come together and have that communication of how do we all work together for a common goal. And so in May, we had our first meeting of the, uh, the workforce development committee. All 20 organizations came together, talked about what they do, and it was amazing to see that many of them were not aware others even existed. But our goal ultimately is to enhance the workforce because with 5,000 jobs coming into Valley, along with all the jobs that we need throughout the community, um, workforce is usually a defining issue in many cases when companies make decisions on where they go. And then the final thing is we created a jobs board. That was one of the things that was, was lacking a little bit. Uh, there's a lot of jobs, Indeed, um, ZipRecruiter, bunch of them out there, but they're sometimes difficult to use, uh, cumbersome, and in many cases expensive. So we created indebtjobs.com. It's a free database system available to any businesses. We launched it uh, about a month ago. Already have several new jobs on there. And the nice thing about the database system that most systems kind of miss is we have the opportunity not only to allow employers to post jobs, but for residents to post resumes so employers can actually search for them instead of them searching for employers. So uh, I invite you to check that out. So I'm going to get into a little bit about economic data. Um, I think a lot of economic developers, especially, and I'm, I'm guilty as any of them over the years, um, sometimes we, uh, we want to report on uh, new jobs and capital investment. And as I've always kind of pointed out, you know, economic development groups don't create jobs and we don't make capital investments. So what we want to do is we want to kind of monitor um, statistics. What is, the, what is the economics of what's happening in our community? How does it translate into into various things. So I'm going to kind of share with you things about commercial property vacancy, business license that have been issued, uh, building permits, and employment levels. So this is a graph looking at commercial vacancy and independence. And we're comparing quarter versus quarter. First quarter of last year, first quarter of this year. Um, I think the one thing that stands out quite a bit is the uh, industrial vacancy going from 1.1% to 6.1%. And that is solely because of the North Point buildings. Uh, it shows you we've always been under 3% on industrial vacancy. There's literally no industrial space that was available, and most of it that was was very old and outdated and not very modern. So now we have space to market. 6.1% is not a bad thing. Honestly, I'd like to have about 10%, to tell you the truth. It gives us something to sell. Uh, on, the, on the retail side, you can see the numbers there. Uh, we're at 10.7 in 2023. We've dropped a little bit. That's a good sign. Our retail space is filling up. On the office side, um, we're actually lower on those numbers than we have been in years past. We were upwards of 17, 18% back in uh, 2016, 2017. Uh, what kind of changed when you saw the, uh, the numbers go from 7.6 to, uh, to 8.5%? Um, it, it, it's pretty marginal. We don't have much of an office market. So, so a 1% change really isn't, uh, isn't much of anything in that, uh, in that market. Um, there's the one area that I think we talk about multifamily housing and um, and occupancy, and this is something that Council I know discussed a lot over the last uh, several months. In fact, I think there was even a moratorium for a short period of time uh, while you did a housing study to understand what is the need that's out there. Well, we looked at data from the first quarter of last year. Um, we were at right now, you know, 93.9% occupancy. 
first quarter of this year, we've only dropped by 1%. So that tells you with, with over 700 units that came online, multifamily units during the last year, the demand was certainly there. And we do have the Adirondacks over by Bass Pro that's coming online here this summer. Uh, we expect probably North Point will uh, start construction on their project sometime later this year. There's still demand there. Um, nationally, if you can stay above that 80% range uh, in terms of, uh, of occupancy, uh, demand is there. And then kind of looking at employment a little bit, employment has been fairly, uh, fairly stable for the most part. I looked at the average kind of going pre-pandemic, um, 2018 through 2022, we were about 54.4. Uh, here in the last couple of years, we've been around the uh, 56,000 level generally, not, not a whole lot of change. I think we'll see that start to shift a little bit uh, with uh, some of the jobs related to the North Point project. And then on unemployment, uh, you can see where we were. We were, you know, 5% and now we're in the, we're in the you know, middle threes. And so that's a, that's a fairly tight labor market when you're in 3%, especially in independence. And then building permits, you can see where we were for 2023 totals, about 40 million. Uh, where we are currently this year compared to the same period last year, uh, we're slightly ahead. We're kind of on trend for where we were in 2023. One thing that could change all that is if uh, North Point actually files a building permit. That's probably a 30 plus million dollar project that'll bump that number on beyond uh, 2023 totals. And then on the commercial side, that's probably the most impressive one. If you look at uh, the total from last year, 57.3 million already this year, five months into the year, we're at 56 million on, uh, on commercial valuation for building permits. Uh, the big driver of that is $18 million for the um, medical uh, center emergency care hospital that North or Center Point's doing at 23rd and Lee Summit Road. But uh, there's a lot of big projects still out there, and so I think that'll be a, a, a number that will continue to grow. And wouldn't surprise me if we hit 100 million this year. Would not surprise me at all. So that's uh, my presentation. I'm glad to take any questions. Anyone, any questions? Please proceed. Sure. Um, Tom, thanks uh, so much for being here and for. Um, sharing in this report uh certainly thoughts and prayers go out to jody and her family and all of you who work with her because um that's important um so um appreciate the information appreciate um uh the you know the the um, comparisons um i guess one of the thoughts that comes to my mind is you know not that there, money's never, never not an option, uh, not not an uh, um, uh, a, uh, uh, obstacle. But if if you had more resources, what would you do with them to help improve our economic development and independence? Um, if 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 it wasn't an uh, um, an issue, you know, um, probably um, we would probably be more involved with um, doing some consultant trips with KCADC. Uh, they do about four or five each uh, during the course of the year. They were just in Los Angeles here meeting with consultants in Los Angeles. Uh, a lot of times I think consultants, you know, they know about Kansas City, they may not know about independence. And so I think just from a marketing standpoint, being able to be in front of those consultants and sharing our story is, is the biggest thing and probably the, the one limitation, we don't have a lot of money within a travel budget to do things like that and it's, things like that are fairly expensive. Gotcha. That, that's helpful. The other thing that I'm anxious to see is the the results of the survey. Um, I think that's really, you know, an important area for us as a city to focus our energy on to make that process of, you know, when somebody decides they want to build or, or improve a facility mm -hmm. here and and bring that through the process. I think we need to make it as seamless and easy as possible within the parameters that you know that we're yeah. we're dealing with. So, um, but um, so I'm anxious to to see that. I think you've um, all heard the the maybe the complaint of well the process is difficult or the process is hard. I've also heard people say you know they've if they've worked in numerous cities the process of independence is very easy. So this will give us some feedback on. You know, if, if there are things we can make better, then, you know, certainly we can, we can work on improving those. But it's just nice to know the feedback of, and, and many of, you know, some of these, as, as we looked at the survey, some of these are new startup businesses that have never done an application before. Some of them, you know, have locations across the country and they're familiar with it. And that, I'm curious as we extrapolate the data, how that will, how that will look compared to the two. 
Right, right, because I've heard both stories as well. Yep. And, and so I'm really anxious to see, you know, some statistically relevant, um, yep. you know, results. So. Look forward to sharing that. All right, thank you. Anyone else other for questions? Anybody else? Okay. Well, thank you very much. And again, our thoughts and prayers for Jody and her family and her friends. And yeah. uh, I appreciate you coming in today. I will thank share that with them. Much. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. All right, Mr. City Manager, sounds like we're going to talk about the square. Yes, sir. How would you like to tee that up? Uh, well, I will, um, in the interest of time, I know uh, many members of the city's master development team that have been working on this project are here. Uh, that is a cross-functional team, so I'm not quite sure which of them is Bill. Okay, uh, Bill Crandall from Copacan Brooks is going to kick this off for us. Thank you, Zach, Mr. Mayor, and members of the council. I'm Bill Crandall with Copec and Brooks, and we're um, here tonight to give you an update on the master plan. And as if you, you may recall that we talked about kind of a three-legged stool um, where <clears throat> we, would, we would have a, a physical master plan, which will be the body of our presentation today. But then that would be married with um, <coughs> a master business plan, which is how are we going to actually induce investment into, the, into, the de into our district uh, as well as um, sort of branding and things like that, so the kind of the business strategy. And third was the master economic plan, and we have members of our team here to talk about that, which and we'll get into more detail. But we do, as uh, city manager mentioned, we do have an interdisciplinary team. So Copac and Brooks, Bill Crandall, my associate Brett Gross is here helping me tonight, and he'll be giving the body of our presentation. But joining our team was Olson Associates, uh, in their in their Olson studio, their planning department. So uh, Darren Varner will be here with that, and then Stephen Nicholas is here with Michael Short, um, who'll be leading the presentation to talk about uh, bonding strategies and things like that. So really, without so those are sort of the three big chunks of information we want to uh, convey tonight. This is, uh, I would say, kind of a, maybe the 50-yard line where we we've got our master plan in place. Uh, we're excited to present it to you. It's had a lot of stakeholder involvement, a lot of support from staff, and uh, but that to me is just the end of the first half, and we want to really begin the second half by going out and in, in really getting new investment into the community. So, with that, I'll I'll turn it over to uh, Darren, who I believe will be given the the update on the master plan, and then feel, we'll, we're here to answer questions too. So, um, so please ask if you if you feel free to. Thank you very much for, for being here. This is an exciting night for us uh, to come in here and talk to you about our progress and where we are. We've already talked to quite a few of you and a, a lot of stakeholders along the way. Uh, a lot, so a lot of this is vetted out according to really uh, what we're being uh, told and what we're trying to listen to and then trying to put it down on paper so it's, it's, uh, it's your vision. So we, as Bill said, we're gonna go through the master plan, the vision, the bonding, and then next steps uh, at the end as we go through and walk through the presentation. I think you've all got a little packet. It's not little, it's, it's pretty big. Uh, so hopefully you can go slide by slide through there and, and fish your way around it through it. Doesn't seem like five months ago or so that we were, some of us were together uh, going through this on a, on a cold, uh, kind of snowy day, uh, looking at all these things and, and then coming up with some initial concepts with everybody. Uh, then vetting that out and, and kind of listening the next day. So it was a two or three kind of day uh, event doing that. And that eventually we went back, did some work, uh, brought it back to the group and then went out to the public and we had, a, had another little event uh, uh, that night. So a lot of, a lot of uh, little, you can see the little post-its that we like to use all over the drawings and getting, and getting those ideas down. Uh, so really, it's all about uh, the community more than it is us. We feel like we're scribes, and if we've done our job at the end, it'll feel like we just kind of helped you get there, but it's your, it's your plan. So I might jump back and let uh, Brett talk about this one. Brett, if you want to go in first of how we're doing that. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so we were kind of looking at the square, and it's, you know, 150 parcels or so, and we were kind of like, where do we start? 
and uh, we had this idea of kind of breaking it down um, into what we see as opportunities for redevelopment um, right now, and that's the, the green. Um, what we see as maybe opportunities in the future that might, um, that might come up, and uh, those are in yellow, and then something that we're not really considering um, you know, making any changes to other than you know, potential facade improvements or something like that um, is in the red and then the blue as uh, repurposing. Um, those are the main items there. And uh, this really, it really stuck out to us. The, the green items were the items that are mostly city or county controlled and um, areas that um, some of them are, that don't have a lot of uh, economic value for the city and looking at changing those first. Um, like lot L, for example, if you can see that, is in the, on the southern edge. And uh, well, it's a big surface lot, half of it's owned by the county, half of it's owned by the city. Um, there's um, a surplus of parking down there, so there's no need for that. And uh, that would be a great opportunity for something like a multifamily development to come into. So that's kind of where this idea started. Um, we call it the the stoplight plan, um, but more formally the redevelopment opportunity plan. And um, we think it kind of showcases how much opportunity there is all around the square, but mainly on the east side um, where the you know municipal buildings are, uh, where we are right now, and then a few other um, parcels. Another couple items on here to help us stay aligned are the the thick uh, black dashed line is the historic district boundary. Um, so keeping things within that as intact uh, for historical purposes as possible is, is critical, uh, maintaining that. And um, a few other things that you'll see down the road, like the thick orange lines are the alleyway corridors. Um, an idea we had when looking at this plan, we saw how um, there's alleyways that uh, are still alleyways or have been filled in or blocked off or something that could be great connection points um, for walking around the square. So that's kind of where we started with this, uh, this color map. And then that allowed us to hone in on those parcels that we think are good opportunities and what would be best fits for those. And so now Darren can come back up and, and talk about all of those pieces. Thanks, Brett. So this next plan, you kind of get a glimpse of what's going to happen. The next uh, drawing will show up there. But there's this is the master plan kind of put in a layer uh, right behind the stoplight plan. So you can kind of then get a little bit better of an idea of where you might be downtown. People have a hard time reading maps usually. Uh, but you can see where the red, the yellow, and the green areas are. And what you really do notice is how much of an asset Nolan Road is and where uh, things really, ha that's where the most, the easiest land uh, to try to redevelop uh, early could be. It's where county or the city owns property uh, along those pieces. So you'll see a, a real attempt in this master plan to green the city, to add a lot more development at Nolan on both sides of the road. And then the farther we progress uh, to the west, we have a little less of the green development uh, areas, but still trying to take care of that part of the, the downtown as much as possible, uh, and then just doing adaptive reuse or some of those cut-throughs in the uh, historic uh, study zone that we're looking at. So then if we move to the master plan uh, part of it, again, if we start to the, to the right side on Nolan Road, the largest chunk that we have that's the easy, the easy piece, and I'll try to see if I can get this cursor to work. It's really not going to work. So between Lynn and Lexington and then Noland and then up on Truman, that's a big piece where the city hall, where we currently are tonight, uh, the police department's in there, uh, and then there's another uh, building that I believe is another city building in that block. That'd be pretty easy to parcel off. What we're looking at there is having a 
uh, that West Ward made the community center could go. A big, we're calling that the civic center, uh, part of the site, really the new heartbeat maybe of, of the downtown. Uh, we're not trying to take away the importance of the Truman Courthouse Square, but uh, this new civic center could be more of, a, of an entertainment zone, a money maker, bringing in a, maybe a museum to that, that part, uh, a food court, or uh, even a, a food uh, grocery store marketplace going there, housing, uh, the community center. Uh, there'd be a lot of underground parking in this with the way the topography works, so we can slide a lot of cars and build mainly a kind of a, a big plant, a big flat spot. Uh, there's, there's a lot of grade down that street that everybody knows, a little challenging to get down there. So if we can really start kind of at Lynn and kind of keep that a lot flatter and tuck things underneath and then take advantage of the community center being tall so it can pop up in that zone, maybe we created a, a very big, nice open space that can be used for uh, concerts, uh, festivals, uh, just great open space in the downtown that, that we really don't have uh, here other than parking lots. Uh, it'd be kind of nice to have some flexible space. Maybe there's a little amphitheater in there so, so we can get those kind of functions going. But really create this really nice block. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a large piece. I think that's about, about an eight or 10 acre uh, piece. So a pretty good chunk, uh, pretty good discovery there. Uh, and then that ties in with Hiram Young Park uh, below. Oops, I, I think I went forward. Uh, where we're kind of going to extend the park a little bit more down towards uh, Walnut, uh, take advantage of that so we can really grasp this big green space that you already have along Nolan uh, there. Uh, going up on Truman, uh, the Sherman Community Center is uh, up there right now. A lot of that use could go into the community center, those things with theater, uh, just those events. So that looks to be a, a pretty prime piece to add more housing. Uh, downtown here uh, and then and let developers kind of determine what that might be but uh, more of a mix uh, kind of a thing going from single family usually there's a place where you go from single family to multifamily we kind of have this missing middle kind of housing uh, so maybe that's a different kind of housing that lets other other uh, kind of people uh, money uh, or, or their money challenges or whatever fit in those slots and then even on the south of that we kind of went outside of our original study area along those tracks to push more housing in on that side. So really trying to create some uh, a pretty good sizable uh, developable piece there for housing on, on east of Nolan. And then as we just, we'll, and we'll have some other exhibits as we go on, but, but Brett talked about the housing piece on Osage and uh, Walnut. That, that down there is basically a big parking lot now, so maybe that could be a nice uh, multifamily piece there, uh, sizable, tall, with some nice amenities there. And just to the left of that, uh, that parking lot in there, we still would use the courthouse kind of shared parking idea uh, in that zone, but maybe a, uh, that might be an optional place to put a grocery store or some mixed use where they're sharing that parking lot with the courthouse. And then off hours, that could also be used for other kind of events down, you know, to help parking uh, for events uh, in the city. If we go north of, of that development on Kansas and uh, Osage, mixed use in there, we think that looks like a good spot uh, for, for that kind of a thing. You'll also see in between there, between that multifamily area and uh, going up to the north, all the way pretty much to Truman, having one of those alleys, those cut throughs. So as the, as the properties redevelop themselves uh, and things happen, trying to keep those corridors open in that design so we can really push uh, pedestrians and, and people up through those, those areas. Um, down to the, uh, to the southeast uh, on Kansas, and then where Lynn and, and Maine and then Noland are, uh, there's some nice housing in there, and we think we can uh, in, do some more infill housing in those areas, again, uh, keeping with the flavor of the housing that's there, so not necessarily multifamily, but maybe uh, uh, townhomes, brownstones, those kind of things, uh, keeping that variety going. I keep touching, touching the scoreboard here. Uh, but kind of keeping that, keeping that alive, adding more, trying to get more density, more housing uh, down here for folks that is going to set up bringing more of this mixed use, uh, readaptive use that, 
that we see. And then along Lexington Avenue, just south of that new civic block on Lynn, uh, in between Lynn and then Memorial, uh, use, use adaptive reuse along that street. Maybe there's some housing that are on the upper floors of that, but make that, uh, maybe that's more commercial down on the street and take advantage of, of the buildings that are, that are currently there. And then one last piece before I jump into the next uh, part of this would be up on Truman and Liberty, between Liberty and Maine, uh, where the Board of Elections currently is located, possibly putting, again, that could, uh, again, is, uh, be develop, uh, developer driven. Maybe that's some grocery store with some mixed use, or maybe it's a hotel, you know, those, those kind of things that could go up along Truman as the market would dictate uh, that piece. And then we'll kind of go through what, what we really like uh, to do. And I, I guess I'll just say one thing before we go too much farther so there's not a lot of, a lot of worry or anything. These are long plans. These are this is a broad, uh, big idea kind of a look at the whole. So we're not, we're not coming in here and saying all these properties are going get, to start getting torn down and all these things are happening. Uh, where the green was, those are a little easier to try to get that land organized and, and acquire those things. Uh, but there's a lot of areas that are going to have to be, you know, they're in the future, they're as, as developers as, as there's need for that, or as property owners decide they want to change what they're doing and, and uh, uh, you know, make their property a little bit different. So there's, there's no suggestion that we're coming here with a bulldozer and, and it's fast or whatever. We do get into that conversation a lot. It's kind of a, a scary thing for us when we're doing these plans where, where we know there's People have invested a lot of money in these properties or might live there, and we're very cognizant of, of those, those pieces. On this identity part, we, we are seeing this next, next part of the presentation is really how we would experience uh, independence downtown when we come here. So we start, most people are going to come here by car. They're not going to just walk for, for wherever. So if they're coming here by car, uh, you're already kind of doing some work here to try to come up with wayfinding signs. Uh, tagging them into historical things. You got a strong history in that, that boundary there. So signage for that, signage on the perimeters in the other places where you enter uh, Independence downtown. Uh, but a variety of those things really to try to brand uh, where we are. So people know I'm downtown, this is gonna be great. Uh, I'm coming into all these, these things that I came to see. Or maybe you're just driving down Nolan, didn't even know it was here, and going, I gotta go in there now. There's this something really cool. As, as Nolan Road progresses. So uh, from a car standpoint, doing a lot of, of, of those kind of identifiers. Then kind of blending cars and people together, uh, the streetscaping uh, throughout the district. Uh, we know there's already a plan in place uh, around the square uh, for, for, that, for that purpose. Uh, I think that's gonna start construction uh, sometime soon here. It's, been ongoing, so we're also suggesting just an overall long-range plan for adding more trees, adding more green space, those kind of things in the downtown area to try to attract uh, more things. So as you come in here by car and then you get out of your car and start walking around, is it is it a nice, beautiful place to walk? Are there trees? Are there potted plants? Is there places to eat along outside? We learned one thing during COVID, a lot of people have pushed their interior space to the outside, so everybody likes to kind of, we've dis rediscovered the outside, it never used to exist uh, almost for uh, I don't know how long. So people really enjoy those kind of things. Uh, you've seen during St. Caligon where you have street parties, maybe close down some streets every once in a while, maybe there's overhead lighting, just those kind of things. So you could really take advantage of your downtown uh, and make it and create new events that don't even exist today. Uh, to attract people down and have street parties or get people into that big civic uh, area that we were talking about uh, before. And then the other thing that we discovered uh, that Brett alluded to a little bit earlier is when we really get down and you're just on the pedestrian level, uh, people are used to being walking along a street, uh, but these alleys, uh, we really see these all over if, if you've been, our office uh, at Olson Studio is in the Crossroads District of downtown Kansas City. Uh, it's happened very organically where people will take these alleys, they're adding their old potted plants, they're putting their own lights in there. Uh, when we have First Fridays, they're setting up events in there, they're getting a lot of vendors in there, uh, letting people paint walls live 
uh, during those events, which is really fun, but it's an organic kind of thing. But as a pedestrian and as a person that knows a little bit about downtown, it's just another point of discovery, another thing that makes it really fun to be here. Uh, Instagram, all the social media stuff, people like these kind of the cruftier kinds of sides. It's kind of, kind of impressive how we've attracted to the crossroads teenagers all the way to, you know, people my age and, and older uh, downtown and in that crossroads area just all blend together. Really, really like it, even though it's, you know, got all kinds of graffiti and, and everything else. It's kind of become part of that fabric. So uh, some of these corridors could be more historical than other ones. Some of them might be more arts oriented. Uh, some of them might, we might attract uh, some restaurants and those kind of foods to push that stuff. Lee Summit does that very well in their, in their downtown where they've taken advantage of all that alleyway uh, information, putting decks out there and let people eat and enjoy those kind of things. So again, kind of an organic thing, but it's really, really adds a whole other layer and a whole other flavor uh, to the downtown. And then one thing we heard in our uh, in our meetings uh, that when we were going through the public was just more outdoor spaces, uh, more things that are more humanized things. Some of these areas on our pictures, we try to find some of the best images we can kind of find. Some of these look a little oversized for what independence is, but they'd be right scaled here. But the point is uh, creating more outdoor space where we can. Sometimes there might be places on the streets where those look like sidewalks and you have pavers and those kind of things in the roadways because that might become a an open festival area at, at some point where you can close streets down. Uh, but really trying to inject some of these, these things to get people out, get people downtown, have some fun, uh, uh, experience and experiencing more things at, at a pedestrian level. And greening of the city. We talked a little bit about that, how nice it already is. You have a park along Nolan, but expanding that out so we go all the way down uh, to uh, Walnut, uh, all the way up to Truman, and then just, you know, maybe we can take advantage of that, that, that median that's in the middle of Nolan Road where we can add some trees in the middle of the, of the Nolan Road, but landscape the perimeters and the sides of that as well. So we really make that an important greenway in uh, to really try to shuttle people into the downtown and get, get everybody excited about those places. We talked about that Civic lawn, that civic space, this is a big, we see that as being like a big synthetic turf kind of an area that, you know, won't get all run down and, and beat up that you can use for just about anything. Uh, people could just relax, eat lunch there during the day, the people that work down here, or you're bringing people in at night or just something on the weekends uh, to have fun. That area is just about as big as some of these parking lots you've been trying to hold some of these events in. So this now would have food and it would have people living there and it would have a museum and uh, those kind of things. So really, really creating a, a tremendous uh, space in there. There's a lot of uh, topography down here. So some of these cut throughs, we could have some really cool stairways like on that step into history thing where maybe those are great places to relax, uh, kind of artistic uh, as well. But just taking advantage and, and, and you know, celebrating the, the steep, some of these steep sites uh, that are there to let people in. Uh, but really, it would be just a great thing to see if we had people just lounging around downtown on some of these things Saturday. I know everybody tries to do that. I know sometimes it seems far-fetched, uh, but it doesn't take a whole lot if you get, the more people you get down here, the more people feel safe, the more people keep coming. Uh, that's, that's the ticket, so getting that housing uh, down here and getting that sense of community. So we go into that community space, food, maker space, uh, where if you don't know what that really means, but some of those, some of these buildings could be repurposed to take care of where you go there for arts and crafts. You could be teaching somebody how to cook. Uh, maybe there's little restaurant tours that can't afford a restaurant, but they can kind of start off in these places and, and do those kind of things. Uh, we talked about the museum. Uh, there's a couple places where that could happen. The Frontier Museum up on Spring and, and Truman. That might be another possibility to kind of rehab that or re adaptive reuse of, of that. Uh, but these other, these other things where we have some of these alley cut throughs, what we're really saying in the historical areas is not tearing that building down, but maybe it comes an art gallery space that we can let people go through and walk through that gallery. And now they're in the backside going to something else uh, on the site and, and dragging and kind of kind of manipulating people's movements a little bit where we want them to try to discover other things. 
So there's a few of these gallery type buildings, the old Jones store, and then across the street from that one, and then if we go down on, I think, what is that? I'm trying to think what name that street is uh, up there, but uh, coming in, we got, we have three of those where really they were like old, one of them especially is the old, an old road that they just kind of packed a building into. It looks like we cut through there, and it's like, a, it's right, uh, it's in between Lynn, is that Lynn? It's the other pink building right up to the top left, up to the top right on where you're looking. That one is a good, a good poke through space. So not tearing buildings down, uh, but trying to create community art spaces uh, in, those, in those places. And then getting people down here just to live. You know, that's, that's going to be one of the big tickets as we go to try to get people shopping, people living. It's kind of a catch-22. What comes first, the housing or the business? Uh, Hopefully a little bit of both at the same time, and, that, and it just kind of builds as we go, or, or events to show people what's going on, if we can get a few of these, these things done, but a variety of housing uh, throughout, throughout the downtown. And then the presentation before us that I think the council, or the, that was being talked about by the chamber, uh, people like to be entertained. You know, they don't just want to go out anymore and just go eat. They want something to be happening. They don't want to just shop. They want something uh, that they can have little mini, almost little mini vacations when they come down here and spend a, spend a few hours. And hopefully you can keep them down here for longer than that. So that's a good reason to have more entertainment injected into these, into these pieces. So maybe some more breweries. You've already have got the farmer's market. Uh, the event square, uh, Truman, uh, we're, we're making a kind of a suggestion here in this plan that maybe even some of Truman can be adaptive reuse where maybe some more uses could go in there. We already have a restaurant in there, but some other things, maybe part of the museum could go in there. Get people inside of that building. There's a lot of people like myself came down here once with my wife and we kind of peeked at it, didn't know if we could go in there, what was going on. Uh, it's a great looking building, but we didn't know what, what we were supposed to do there, so we tried to find other things to do. So if there was a way to even get in there so everybody could go, wow, this is a great building. Uh, we know why it's here, we know the importance of it, maybe some of that goes on. So uh, maybe even put a little bit of an entertainment inside of the courthouse, the Truman Courthouse. And then just the tourism that that entertainment and everything else brings, uh, the entertainment, uh, the staying, uh, all, the, all the places to, to, to capture people when they come down. Uh, that's the end goal is, is tourism, entertainment, getting it busy. So I think we'll let just wanted to come back up and uh, apologize. I left one of my good team members off of the introduction, Dan Pierce with Tesserae Architecture, and he's going to go through uh, some other exciting visuals on what the, what the master plan could look like. Thank you, Bill. Good evening. Um, here in my joke, I was going to tell a joke about forgetting the most important part of the team because we're the hometown members, but... Um, <laughs> Anyways, I've, I've already forgiven him. We're good. There's no, uh, no hard feelings. Um, for those that don't know, I'm Dan Pierce. I'm with Tesserae. Um, our building is literally uh, just on the other side of City Hall here. You can hit a pitching wedge and hit our building. Um, if I'm hitting, I'm probably hitting a driver, knowing my golf game. So um, I think Chief can attest to that back there. Thank you, Chief. Um, so my job as... Um, Director of Visualization at Tesserae is to take information and data and plans and we take that and we craft it into a story, um, something that's more easily to, easy to digest and understand. Um, a lot of times when people are looking at plans or just flat drawings, um, it, it's difficult to understand. So that's where um, I start to bring things to life with 3D. That's really where I'm working. Um, you will not catch me with a, a drafting table or trace paper. I am all digital, so I'm working in um, the 3D realm. And what you're seeing here is uh, a photogrammetry model that we've created of the square. Um, photogrammetry, if you don't know what it is, I won't get into all the details. It's basically taking a bunch of drone photos and processing those into a, um, a 3D model. So there's about... 2,500, 2,600 photos that we've taken and we've stitched it all into this model that you see here. Um, and I'm gonna move to, do we have, okay, there we go. 
Um, what you're seeing on this slide, and this is kind of a, an evolving thing, and we're, we're, we keep layering information on as we go. We're really just looking at the low-hanging fruit um, that Brett, Brett and Darren had talked about earlier um, when we were looking at the stoplight plans, the, the, the green areas. So I'm going to attempt to not advance slides here as I'm pointing with this. Um, so what you're seeing, we're, we're the very high level, what we're looking at, uh, to lower the screen to kind of orient you here, we're looking towards the north. You can see um, Nolan Road here, Main Street. Um, I'll have all the, all the main arteries uh, labeled on here, but we'll start kind of at the lower corner here. Um, you see uh, at the corner of Walnut and Spring, and then the, the city lots at uh, Osage, I'm sorry, uh, what did I say, Walnut and Spring, and then Osage and Spring, um, the city lot and the county lot. Um, I'm not going to go rehash everything that, that Darren has gone into. He's kind of hit all the, the high level things, but I just want you to, to get a better visual of where everything's at. Um, the other two green pieces that we're looking up here, you have the uh, the postal service uh, parking lot, and then this is the parking lot that is um, on the back side of the Jones store building. Uh, I'm trying to think of what there's the Sentinel Room and Marinello are kind of here on the corner. Um, we've also looked at the uh, Board of Elections building, the city parking lot here, and then the Faro Theater parking lot. Uh, and then as you move further to the east, um, City Hall is here. This is the, uh, we got Lynn Street that I don't have labeled on there, but the um, Dempsey Theater building. And then I believe the one next to that is a uh, city owned building. Um, that lot, obviously with the, the news of the um, relocation of um, the police station, we're looking at this lot and it's really opening up a, a tremendous opportunity um, for this corner at Nolan and Truman to become the gateway into the square. We think it's um, is going to be a really, really dynamic uh, way to kind of a pronounce the arrival to the square. Um, and as you move further east, um, we're looking at uh, the Sermon Center, some of the parking lot in that area. And then even, we don't have it in our boundary here, but we're starting to look at um, some of the facilities buildings here that run along um, East Lexington. Um, what we've started to do on the next slide is layer in some more information. And again, this is very high level. Do not get hung up on the design of anything. They're really just kind of placeholders right now. But just to give you more a sense of um, the scale of things and how it might relate to other pieces of the square. Um, so again, I'll start at the bottom left. You know, Darren had talked about the grocer. Maybe there's uh, opportunity for multifamily. Um, one thing that we are trying to keep in mind as we're looking at this, um, you know, we, we don't want to, um, I don't know a better way to say it. We don't want to be Overland Park. We don't want to get crazy with scale. I think we want to be respectful of the scale that we've already established here in town. Um, so, you know, we're trying to maximize uh, room counts with these, but we also want to maintain, uh, respect the, uh, the scale of everything. We, we want to respect the history and um, uh, the tradition that has been long established here. Um, if we look at the parking garage that we're showing here where the postal service is, um, maybe that's a potential to, uh, and again, there's a lot of assumptions being made, but there, maybe there's a potential to um, have conversations with the post office and uh, might be an opportunity to go vertical with some parking to add some more uh, parking for visitors. Maybe we carve out part of that for their fleet vehicles. Um, to the right of that, we're looking at uh, potential for a pocket park. Maybe is, there's a museum. We understand that um, the Three Trails Museum may need a new home uh, outside of the Truman Memorial Building, so maybe there's not a potential to put that there. Um, up here on Truman, again, where the uh, Elections Board Building was, we, we were showing a, a hotel and some parking right along Truman. Um, and then kind of the more civic center that Darren had talked about, you know, we have multifamily, we have um, the retail component, maybe there's a museum component, community center, um, and again, really putting those high traffic, high volume pieces at that uh, intersection of Truman and Nolan where we could, you, you're, you're drawing people into the space, you're announcing the, uh, your, the arrival, you, you know that you're here on the square. And again, you see some more lower density um, housing projects to, uh, to the east where the Sermon Center is. Um, and then if I go to the next slide, what we're showing here 
Uh, Darren had talked a little bit about kind of the, um, oh, it was the uh, alleyway opportunities that we're looking at. And, um, you know, he, he mentioned, and I'll, I'll reiterate, we're not looking to knock down anything, especially that's inside of the uh, historic boundaries. Um, the best analogy I can think of is you think of um, the Pharaoh Theater, I don't want to call it a pass-through, but if you're going in the front doors, um, you know how it connects all the way back to the parking lot. Maybe there's an opportunity. Um, I think there was three that we've really kind of identified. Um, there's one here that would connect to the farmer's market, one through the Jones store building. Um, some ideas that have been tossed around have been kind of, if you guys have been to parlor down in the crossroads, kind of that food hall idea, maybe that's something that could occur uh, inside the Jones store building. Um, where's my other one? Where was that at? Oh, I think that's, yes, that's going through, I want to say that's close to the gateway building. I don't know which, but, but if you think of it more as like a pass-through, so you're still maintaining the, uh, the historical integrity the, uh, and the fabric of the square, but we're finding ways to kind of weave everything together better and make it more, um, you know, maybe there's opportunities for some art installations or places for gathering, but really you're, you're connecting the square uh, in a better way, it makes it more manageable from foot, um, you know, for visitors, so they don't have to go around the entire block to get somewhere. You're you're creating those opportunities um, to to navigate the square quicker. So uh, that's what this image here is looking at. I think that might be my last slide. Yeah, I'm gonna hand it back over to Brett here. Thanks, Dan. All right, so. Jump back real quick. Um, so, as one thing we like to say to realign ourselves with reality, like they've alluded to, is everything we've shown, the plans we've we've created, are wrong. Right? It's not going to get built out exactly as we plan it. Um, we use this as a visualization to what it could be to spur ideas, to show developers uh, and citizens what it could be and um, entice people to develop here what the city wants to be developed and, um, and get people excited for what it could become. And uh, part of being able to execute on um, the visions like this is having a plan, actionable, um, executable steps. So that's what I'm gonna talk about now. Um, the first thing we did was a uh, independent third-party study of the current conditions of the real estate market on the square, uh, primarily focused in four sectors, retail, multifamily, office, and hospitality. A um, few of the key findings, uh, the uh, square has lower retail supply per capita than surrounding areas. The, there's been no multifamily construction on the square for over 20 years. Uh, the current office supply meets demand, um, and then uh, there's no ho there's no hotels on the square, um, part of the hospitality sector. Um, but it uh, there could be upscale select service hotel um, for that based on the study, and um, all those all those key points we kind of already knew. The development in the square has been pretty stagnant for a long time, and so this is the basis that we're, the whole purpose of this master plan is to, to move from this into something better. So the first, or the, I should say the second leg of the stool, uh, where the first leg is that master vision, is the master business plan. The um, key components of that uh, is, number one is a land control strategy. So the importance of land control for the city is to assemble parcels that uh, are identified as good opportunities for developers and then find developers and work with them uh, to develop what the city wants in those pieces. Um, that also shows a commitment to developers that the city is serious about, about developing the square, redeveloping the square, and, um, and willing to work with developers by, um, you know, Spending, spending money or 
going into development agreement to acquire land um, that they can hold for developers when the right one comes along. Uh, part of it um, is the timeline, of course, from redevelopment plan adoption all the way through construction of new development, um, the goal. The, um, another part of it to really kickstart that that we're going to do is developer outreach. So once this um, plan is adopted, we would go on a roadshow pretty much to local developers that um, are experts in certain areas that we want to bring to the square and uh, present to them everything we're showing here, but in its final form. And uh, the other you know, offerings that the independence has to work with, work with them to get them to come here. Um, the third leg of the stool is the economic plan. Um, a component of that is uh, what Stiefel's doing right now, which partly what they're going to talk about next, where uh, determining independence's current and projected bonding capacity, as well as other public financing tools that could be utilized. Uh, developing the budget for the city, so the city knows how much they have to spend and when, um, and making those decisions with all of the information in front of them. And then uh, developing a public-private partnership strategy where utilizing existing tools, um, such as the Missouri, uh, the Missouri uh, Historic Tax Credits, uh, just got recently adopted. Those uh, are for rehabilitating uh, historic buildings that qualify. Um, so that's something that could be used. Um, looking at other tools that could be adopted that could incentivize developers, such as um, like a, a zoning overlay district where we uh, or the city says what, what they want in, in there. And if a developer aligns with that, then they can have more of a fast track process through the approvals and get to development because um, what they care about is, is time and money. And so making it as easy as possible for them to, to come to the city and build what we want them to build uh, is, is really the, uh, the linchpin in, in making this work. Um, so before we jump to the next one, uh, recapping the, the three legs that we talked about, the master vision, um, what we want, uh, the master business plan, which is uh, how, uh, how it can happen, and then the master economic plan, which is how it can be financed publicly and privately um, so we can, we can start building stuff as soon as possible. Are there any questions um, before we jump to the bonds that anyone wants to answer? If I could just interrupt, if I could just interject here, typically when we go about 90 minutes, we take about a five minute break. So if we could do that, if that's conducive for everyone here, uh, let's take about a five minute break and we'll come right back and then talk about municipal capital financing bonds 101. Sounds Thank good. you. Thanks.
please proceed. No. Okay. We'll move, we'll move on with the rest of the presentation. Sure, yes, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to reiterate the purpose of what we're doing here, and that really is to present, you know, a vision, but, it, but, but just as importantly, an execution plan where I think when we interviewed, I said, I don't want to do studies, I want to build stuff. So from, from a developer's perspective, um, you know, what's, what matters to them are, is sort of having a clear guide path, glide path. So having a good plan, having land control, having some finance tools, uh, incentive tools, having the will of the council and the staff to support, a, you know, easy access to opportunity is really what we're all about. And so we want to, once we get this, I don't, I, we're not going to wait until the plan is formally adopted by council, but we'll probably, we'd like to start socializing the plan soon, immediately. And, uh, and getting interest from the development community. So with that, uh, Steve Nicholas will come in and provide an update on the bond strategy. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Mr. Mayor, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Michael Short from Steve Nicholas. I'm here tonight with my colleague, Mackenzie Steeclaw, and we are happy to be here and to share some information with you. Steeple Nicholas is a national investment banking firm headquartered in St. Louis. We work in the Kansas City office. We're under contract with the city to work on the money part of this. You've heard about the vision. You've heard about um, ideas. And we are involved to eventually come up with a plan on how you might do all or part of that. Bill started out by uh, referencing an analogy uh, akin to being on the 50-yard line. For us on the financing part, we probably just got the ball. Okay, so we're, we're watching um, what is happening and how the plays progress. And I sort of uh, uh, compare us to the special teams coaches. We're now going to figure out how to do a couple of special things and, and get on where we need, where we need to be. So um, we're going to walk through the presentation. Um, I'm figuring this out. There we go. All right. First of all, we're going to talk very generally about what is a municipal bond in, in simple terms. What is the bond issuance process? Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, City of Independence current credit profile, which is critical to any, any kind of financing plan. And then talk a little bit about potential funding options and some of the bigger, broader, overreaching goals and pictures here. But first, I'm going to ask McKenzie to come up and talk to you about what is a municipal bond. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, everyone, for having us. Um, very glad to be here tonight. Um, so as Michael kind of alluded to, we're going to start pretty basic with what is a municipal bond and then kind of expand from there. Um, so a municipal bond is a debt security issued by a state or local. Oh, there we go. There you go. <laughs> thank you, Michael. Uh, is a uh, debt security issued by a state or local uh, government authority to finance capital projects. Um, and it's funded by a loan made by investors um, who are kind of pooled together um, by an underwriter. Um, for example, that would be Stiefel. Um, you can kind of think of it as a, as a mortgage loan um, where the bondholders are the creditors uh, to whom principal and interest is due to. Um, the revenue stream used to repay the investors or the bondholders determines um, the type of bond that it is, as I'll go over on this page. Um, so general obligation bonds are going to be payable from an ad valorem tax on real property within the city. Um, these taxes may be levied without limitation to the rate, um, and therefore they're an unlimited uh, pledge, uh, a full faith and credit of the city or whomever the issuer is. Um, and city can also support the debt payments with other sales tax revenues as well. Um, but even if they are uh, supported by other sales tax revenue, um, general obligation bonds will, will keep their unlimited pledge, uh, full faith and credit of the city. Um, now, lease debt, uh, also known as certificates of participation or revenue bonds, are supported by an operating levy or a specific, specific revenue stream of the project. General obligation bonds will require voter, voter approval of either four-sevenths or two-thirds, as I'll go over on the next slide in a little bit more detail. Um, whereas a lease debt or revenue bonds uh, may not require vo voter approval um, if the bonds will be paid for from the current operating levy, so no increase in operating levy is needed, um, or if they're paid for from revenues of the proposed project or any other legally available funds of the city. So general obligation bonds will carry a higher credit rating and therefore lower interest rates because of their unlimited um, pledge, whereas lease debt or revenue bonds will carry a lower credit rating and slightly higher interest rates because they're a limited obligation of the city. 
Uh, general obligation bonds, uh, they'll have a debt limit as a percent of assessed valuation of the city. Um, so for Missouri cities, it's 10% for general purposes, another 10% for streets and sewers, and another 10% for water and electric, but the total aggregate cannot exceed 20% of the city's assessed valuation. Um, whereas lease debt or revenue bonds uh, do not have a debt limit. Um, general obligation bonds uh, have a maximum maturity of 20 years, um, so they must be paid off within 20 years, whereas lease debt or revenue bonds can be paid off in 30 years or more. Um, so this slide just kind of lays out the important election dates um, and voter approval required. Um, so as I alluded to on the previous slide, um, if the city was considering um, an April 8, 2025 election date, notice to the election authorities would be required by January 28, 2025, and four-sevenths approval would be required by voters. Um, and something to note here, um, you see the approval required for odd number years, the, that kind of middle column in the top table. Um, so for an April election, four-sevenths is required, whereas all the other elections next year will, would require two-thirds voter approval. I'll just kind of briefly go over the entire bond issuance process from beginning to end. Um, so it kind of starts with the state or local government has a capital project um, need um, and a dedicated source of payment to pay for that. Um, from there, they'll engage the financing team, um, which again, be us at Stiefel. Um, and, and along with the city, we would determine the financing plan and the schedule. Um, and that is things like when would the city obtain, or if they would ob obtain a credit rating, um, when we would sell the bonds and things like that. Um, so once the financing team determines the financing plan, uh, an election may be required, as we discussed um, two slides ago. And if it's approved, um, the governing body would then approve the financing structure, um, which again, we would kind of be working on that with the city in conjunction with the city along the way. That wouldn't be a surprise to you at that point. From there, the financing team prepares the necessary offering documents and markets the bonds to the potential buyers. And at that point, um, we will uh, market the bonds and the potential, uh, potential investors uh, will purchase the bonds. And on that, at that point, interest rates are set based on investor demand on that day. Uh, the city then approves the issuance of the bonds and the bond documents are finalized and executed in preparation for the closing uh, when the bonds are then delivered to the purchasers or the investors and the city uh, receives their project funds. I kind of went over that slide pretty quickly, but from, from step one to eight um, could take anywhere from several months to, in some cases, it takes several years. Um, so there are four major players in the bond issuance transaction. Um, so it starts with the issuer. Um, so in this case, it would be you, the city, um, the underwriter, again, that's us at Stiefel, and we are responsible for selling the bonds to the bondholders, and in uh, return, we receive proceeds from them. And on the closing date, we send the proceeds to the trustee, and the trustee is responsible for collecting the payment from the issuer and dispersing that to the bondholders. I'm going to turn it back over to Michael. All right. Thank you, Mackenzie. Um, this is a very exciting subject, I know, and I can see it all in your faces. Um, <laughs> the essence of selling bonds is credit. I mean, investors want to know that they're going to get paid back what they loaned you with interest <coughs> in the time period that you agree to pay them back. So it's just like any other credit transaction you're involved as, a, as an individual. And what goes into considering that? The financial condition of the issuer? What do your books look like? What's your bank account look like? What's your history look like? Sources of repayment, is this a new source of funding? Is this existing funding? And, it bear, it, the, and, and the gambit, it runs the whole gambit with jurisdictions about how, how they're gonna pay them back. Cash flows and reserves. How much cushion does the jurisdiction have to absorb issues that occur or to absorb shortfalls in economic development projections, which I know you all have experienced? in this city. So that's part of their analysis. Current and future borrowing needs, is this phase one of a plan or is this the whole thing? So are they looking at the whole thing or there might be a possibility you're gonna come back and, and borrow some additional money and, and leverage out your revenues further. Your current bonding and additional legal debt capacity, McKenzie mentioned that if you use, constitu uh, if you use um, general obligation bonds as an example, there are constitutional limits on that. 
about what the Constitution will allow you to do. And then finally, desire for local distribution of bonds. And this is an important thing for many cities, um, particularly cities like yours, um, who may contain people who are interested in buying these bonds, who are interested in investing in their city. And we work hard to structure the arrangement in the sale so that those individuals have an opportunity, in fact, a priority opportunity, to purchase bonds of the city in which they live. It's, it's very, this is a very popular concept with school districts in particular because people want to invest in their school districts, and so we work hard on that. All right, let's talk about the credit rating process and the credit rating chart. Here we've illustrated the charts that the three major credit rating agencies use, Moody's Investor Services, Standard & Poor's, and Fitch. There are four investment grade categories. And within the three lower ones, AA, A, and B, or BAA, there will be subcategories. Now, if you're a AAA, you're a AAA. There's no AAA plus, AAA minus. If you're AAA credit, and there are real few AAA credits, uh, then you're a AAA credit. And that's the gold standard for, for a lot of people to get to. A lot of jurisdictions, not very many do. The state of Missouri still is a AAA. The federal government on a given day might be, or not, but um, they are because they can print all the money that we can give them. Um, so excellent, upper medium, and lower medium. I've highlighted the A. That is where the city of Independence is right now. Based upon your last Standard & Poor's credit rating in 2001, in October and November of 2001, so coming up on three years ago, the city was rated A by Standard & Poor's. Not A+, plus, not A-, minus, A, right in the middle of the medium um, range. So a good, a good rating for the city. If you drop down to non-investment non grade, you're not, you're not selling those bonds. And it's, it's tricky and it's tough. Okay, you're going to pay more than you can afford to pay for that. The independent credit rating agency will determine through an analysis process what your credit rating is. There's an application you fill out. There's data that you provide. That's what we do. We work very closely with jurisdictions in providing the audits, providing the budgets, providing the analysis to help their credit committees decide what your rating ought to be. There are some things that you can control. There are some things you can't control. Three large criteria, demographics, income, growth, and economy. A lot of your demographic statistics you don't really control. Now you may put policies in place to try to grow the economy, and so you're doing some things there to impact it, but you don't really control it. And you certainly don't control the average and um, per capita income statistics for your citizens, other type of demographic data. It, it, it is what it is. Financial position, existing debt, the reserves that you have, and your operational health, your operational budgets. Do you budget in the black and do you end in the black? Um, things like that they will look at. And then finally, management. They look closely at how the city governing body and the city staff manages the city. Do you have policies in place? You all do. One of the things we work closely with jurisdictions is looking at those policies, financial management policies, reserve policies, budget policies, fund balance policies, investment policies, economic development policies, all of these things that these credit rating agencies want to see. That's part of the good management methodology that they look at. They will then issue a written rating report. And that's what investors look to, to decide whether you have sufficient credit quality for them to buy your bond. And um, some investors are looking for maybe a credit quality that's not quite so high, because for them that means a higher yield. They're going to be able to get a higher yield on their investment. If you've got a AAA rated general obligation bond, you're getting a real low yield. But some investors are only going to buy those. And there's a market, there's a market for almost everything. And ultimately, it's their analysis of whether or not you have an ability and a willingness to pay the debt. So they charge a fee. Nobody does anything for free. So the rating agency charges a fee to the jurisdiction based upon the size of the issue. That's, they have a sliding scale. The more work they do, the larger the fee. General obligation bonds and smaller issuers have the lowest amount of fees. All right, now what I want to show you here was an excerpt from the Moody's Investor Services scorecard. Every
every one of these rating agencies has what we call methodologies. They publish those. They're out there if you know where to look for them. They are guidebooks for us. We go through those things and we work with jurisdictions to meet the criteria that are set forth in the methodologies. This particular one is an overview of Moody's U.S. City and County's scorecard. One of the reasons I wanted to really point this out was to emphasize how larger percentage at 30 percent financial performance is in the scoring of any credit analysis for a jurisdiction. Financial performance is broken down into two categories. Available fund balance ratio. How much money do you have vis-a-vis -vis what your ongoing operational expenses are? They want to look at your reserve balances and they always report it in terms of a percentage. If you're in the teens, it's not good. If you're in the 20s, it's better. Most of the time when I read these reports, if they're in the low 30s, they consider those robust fund balances. And that's our target with a jurisdiction is to get you into a low 30% reserve ratio. So that's the first part of it. And then the other is liquidity. H how fast can you get to that money? So um, they want to know that you can convert that quickly if you need to be able to do something with it. All right. Let's talk about the, the um, city's current ICR, which is issuer credit rating. And that's the underlying rating that the city has. And everything is built off of that. The most recent report, as I indicated, rated the city um, as an A. And there were, um, th then the report that was issued, they, they provided an overview. And we've, we've taken text right out of the overview so that you can see it. And um, they summarize key assessments and indicators. Adequate economy at the time with access to broad and diverse Kansas City metropolitan statistical area, but it's offset a little bit by weaker incomes in the city. Standard financial policies and practice under financial management assessment methodology, we talked about that, with an approved fund balance policy which the city is falling short of, and they made a point of that. Uneven historical budgetary performance, which led to reserves being inadequate, or adequate but lower than similarly related credits, and then a very weak debt and contingent liability profile. That was a challenging time for the city. This financing was done through the MDFB, which is the Missouri Development Finance Board for the Independence <laughs> Event Center Project. Some of you may have been around then. You, may, you know the story. Um, you also had another financing that was done, the Cracker Barrel, or Cracker Creek, Cracker, Cracker something, <laughs> Cracker financing, um, and it had some trouble, <laughs> had some trouble, and uh, some of that has, has been refunded and redone and reworked, um, and so if you've been around a while, you know that there are some stories that I know management has been working hard to address and to turn around. Some of that happened because, like many other jurisdictions, you, had, you, you, you hit a bad spot. There was a rough spot in the economy for a while. You are not the only city that we talked to who had what we call a credit dip, okay? So it happened. And the credit rating agencies are recognizing that it's coming back and that people are, you know, that things are, are better. Um, and so um, we wanted to provide you with a couple of these excerpts. Now, to bring all this down to rubber, you know, hitting the road, um, we got this great vision and stuff that we've started talking about tonight, but how do you really pay for it? I mean, what are you really gonna do? So in very broad brush terms, we ask Zach and the staff some questions. And we were told that um, there's an estimated $250 million in public improvements that could be funded in this city. Things that have not been done. A lot of it on the square that could be done, but stuff elsewhere that hasn't been done. Some have mentioned general obligation bonds as a funding option. And um, we mentioned there's a capacity limitation. But in reality, you all have about a $382 million capacity in this city to issue general obligation bonds. So I find it challenging to believe that you would exceed your capacity or bump up against that. Okay, so I think you have plenty of general obligation bond capacity if that's the route you go. But this is a big vision. This is a big dream. 
and in other similar sized cities that we represent and work with, there are always multiple components to the financing package. It is a not, not a one size fits all type situation. Um, you can fund these improvements and the bonds that support them with general obligation <coughs> bonds. You can fund them with sales tax revenue bonds. You have a, options in a city like this, particularly a city like this that draws visitors and draws non-residents to pay sales tax. And that's very common in this metropolitan area. You have an advantage over school districts, for instance, which can only leverage property taxes. And so that, that, makes it, that makes city financing at least different than school district financing or fire district financing or library district financing. They have limited sources of revenue. This type of a financing, um, I would estimate, would have a number of different components including some developer financing components, some private placement components, some special district components, undoubtedly a general obligation bond component and a sales tax component because you're gonna need all of that to do the things that I hear discussed and uh, that uh, people are talking about wanting to do. So as I mentioned, the planning team may be on the 50 yard line, but we're, we're just getting started. So this, all of this has to be fine tuned throughout the summer and the fall as you all look to where you're going next. But eventually what you expect from us is to come here one night and say, okay, here, here's what you wanna build and what they say it's gonna cost and here's how we think you can do it. And, and so here, here are the things we suggest that you do to do it. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you all might have. I know that was kind of quick. We did attach a glossary of a whole bunch of terms. So normally during this presentation, we go through a lot of these terms. I spared you that, but they're attached in a glossary for your benefit, okay? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Anyone, any questions? Please proceed. I don't really have questions. I have more statements. Sure. So do you want those please now? Uh, please proceed. Okay. Um, having lived in independence for most of my life, um, it's, it can be a challenging place. Um, the only thing people hate more than the way things are is change of any kind, uh, which is a space of having to uh, negotiate the idea that we actually could get better and deserve a city that serves us well. Um, so there's a lot of work that has to be done by the public at large, as well as council members for us to think about what could be. Um, certainly, you know, trips that we've taken to communities who have made hard choices about how they finance, what they would like the amenities in their city to be, and have a long-term strategic plan with partners Chamber of Commerce, their local banks, um, their funding agencies, developers, and obviously city government, those places are successful. You look at Manhattan, Kansas, with their Flint Hills Discovery Center and their slow evolution of that space, it is fantastic. Um, you look at Power and Light, which a lot of people say was a complete waste of money, a total overreach by the city, and that should never have been done. What a dynamic area. Um, my kid comes home to visit me only to go to Power and Light. I'm like, <laughs> fine. Um, you know, you look at Lee Summit, they have slowly and methodically rejuvenated their downtown. It's a lovely place to go for dinner and to go shop. Crossroads, the same thing. Uh, the recent trip we took to San Antonio, people with a vision and it is easy to be so anchored by our immediate that we can never think of, plan for, or reach for things that are long-term plans. Many of us won't be here when this gets done, but it is our obligation to plant the tree that we will never see grow to fruition because if nobody plants it, nothing grows. Um, it is terrifying for some people to even have this conversation. There's so many what ifs, what if we do it wrong? What if we don't um, see the fulfillment of this entire project? 
we can continue to live in grandma's basement or we can choose to have a place that our kids are going to want to live. So um, I see a lot of questions that still have to be answered, but you can see where this could go. And I just hope we have the courage to explore that in the ways that we need to. So thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Anyone else, other questions or comments, concerns? Mr. What? Mayor. Please proceed. So, so I, I just want to say I appreciate the vision that has been uh, expressed uh, tonight. Um, I am excited by that, and um, I, I wasn't bored by the financial side of it at all. Um, that won't be a surprise to anybody. Um, but um, I just want to say that, you know, um, uh, I really do appreciate the vision of what was shared tonight. And, and I think the, the most important thing that we, a challenge that we have before us is sharing with our citizens and those that would um, choose to develop here and, and spend their resources here is that we deserve this type of a vision uh, in independence. It's, it's not um, so far-fetched that we can't reach out and grab it. And so I really um, am excited by this and really appreciate what's been shared and look forward to the next steps. And I hope those next steps come very soon. So. Thank you, Council Member. Anyone else? Other thoughts? Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you for taking the recess because I absolutely forgot to bring down my downtown redevelopment coordinating committee report, which is kind of the beginning stages that we, we worked on back in 2017, 2018. This is actually a, um, another step forward working on this plan and, and visualizing the plan that took over a year to, to develop through a coordinating committee that um, took, gosh, 15, 16, 17 reports that we accumulated over the years, digested them, went to different communities, looked what they were doing, looking at different areas of development, how can they work and how does it fit into the city of Independence. After 12 months, they brought it and, and, and gave it to the city council for review, for consideration. And this is one of the, the next action steps for the square. Even though it says downtown redevelopment, coordinating committee report, it did take more of a bigger holistic look at some of the areas, mainly in the, the northwest side of Independence, um, and gave us a great blueprint on financial steps and economic development tools that we've implemented. As I review this every once in a while, um, we've knocked off quite a bit out of this with Inglewood um, moving forward with Fairmont, the, uh, the things we've done on the Independence Square. So this is just a great natural flow of what can take place. The visions that we are, are putting forth, um, they're not set in stone but it does give us a good good footprint. It's been great working with Bill and his team and, and getting to know them and their expertise to help us take the next step. It's exciting, it's scary, but it's something that we need to do as a community. If we're gonna be competitive, if we're gonna bring different types of redevelopment to our city, if we're gonna look as our economic partnerships uh, our economic partner uh, through the chamber as they were discussing with us that the nature of business, the nature of, of economy is changing. How do we adapt? How do we move forward with that? How do we tap into our, our historical significance, our, our um, history, our tourism, our athletic tourism? How do we move to, to make our general obligation um, to our citizens more complete through better streets, better parks, better infrastructure, but also stuff that they want to use and, and bring back to the city. So thank you for, for taking the time, working with us. This is a great next step. It took us five years to get here, so it, uh, it's good to see it moving. Well done. Anyone else? Mr. Please Mayor, proceed. I just want to add, um, I get asked a lot, um, or you hear people talk a lot 
uh, and compare us to places like Blue Springs and Lee Summit and, you know, Liberty and why aren't we this, why aren't we that? You know, we have something in independence that, that no one else has, which is this amazing history that we're all so proud of. And one of the reasons that there is a difference is our community hasn't done a geo bond. Mm -hmm. And so it is scary and I know um, what it's going to cost all of us is a question and we're gonna have to work on that and answer that question. But this is the kind of plan that's going to stop that conversation about why we're not this place or that place. So I'm excited about it. We can dream, we can aim high, and then we can, we can work on it with um, the, the feedback of our constituents um, and working together with uh, council and mayor and staff. Thanks. Thank you, well done. Anyone else? Okay, and, and I concur with uh, my colleagues uh, what I hear from citizens is the word refresh for our city, and this is an opportunity for us to do that. So with that being said, Mr. City Manager, I'll turn it over to you if you'd like to have any closing comments. Yeah, uh, Mayor, thank you again. Thank you for the feedback of the, uh, the council. It is an exciting night, and as Councilmember Perkins said, um, there have been many weeks, months, and years uh, working to get here. Uh, can't see it on TV, but seated in the back corner are many of the merchants and stakeholders from the square. A lot of credit goes to them for buying into this vision long before um, City Hall showed up and decided to throw our shoulder into this as well. So um, I'm looking forward, as Councilmember Fierce said, to bringing next steps to the council. Uh, that will involve um, wrapping up some of these feasibility studies that we've talked about. Um, bringing forward a resolution of endorsement to adopt this re redevelopment plan officially so that your master developer team can go out and begin to um, full-throated socialize this in the development community uh, and start to build some excitement in the private sector while we do our work on these public sector improvements um, that are forthcoming. Thank you again for the opportunity to present tonight. You bet. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Anyone else? Other comments before we wrap? All right. We'll call this morning adjourned. Thank you very much.